Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure, also known as CES. And uh, Wednesday night, so we do these uh, Bible studies. Uh, we're working our way through the Pauline epistles. And tonight we are on Ephesians chapter 2. What verse has it been? 14? Yes, we're in 14. So that's where we're going to uh, begin tonight. So get your Bibles ready, and we will uh, start in just a moment. But let's say hello to the congregation first, and let's start with our untwisted sister, Renee. Hey there, beloved ones. I'm looking forward to Ephesians. I just love uh, the Pauline epistles anyway. I mean, even his salutations are chock full of stuff we overlook. So I'm looking forward to uh, the study tonight. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. And Brother Ben, will you say hello to everybody too? Yes. Hello, everyone. It's good to be here on this Wednesday uh, studying the word with you all. Looking forward to it. All right. Let me take a quick look at the chat room and say hi to everybody before we get started here. All right. Looks like everybody's raring to go. Hello and blessings to everybody in the chat room. Okay. Looks like they're chomping at the bit to get started, Renee. So let's go. Uh, um, I'll read, uh, begin with verse 14, chapter 2 in the KJV reads, um, For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. I think we can stop there. Uh, yeah, that's a lot. Go ahead, Renee. Yeah, uh, so we're picking up from last week where he's talking about how the Gentiles were really, really far from God. And it was very depressing if he had just left us there. So let's look at that. He said, and at that time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So that was our state before Jesus. We had no hope. We had no connection to God. We had no promises. We had nothing. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And we're made close to God by the blood of Jesus. It's what more people need to get. It's only the blood of Jesus that makes you have a relationship with God. It is only the blood of Jesus that's reconciled you. That's it. It's not, you can never do anything in sinful flesh to make yourself righteous or clean enough to be able to even approach God's throne. We need to understand that. So with that being said, he tells us you were far off. You're made nigh by the blood of Christ for he is our peace. Jesus is our peace. It's him who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of part partition between us. So he has made both one who the Commonwealth of Israel and Gentiles. He's made one new man in Christ, reconciling us to God through his blood. He is our peace. Uh, and there's a semicolon there broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And then we're, we're going to stop there. But if you go uh, a little back to what we read last week, he talks about how Gentiles being in times past in the flesh are called uncircumcision by that, which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hand. So he's saying our Gentiles are called the uncircumcision by the Jews who are circumcision, but that's in the flesh. And he's uh, confirming here that things done in the flesh, like circumcision, they were a shadow and that they have no bearing on salvation or in relation to covenant with God. Amen to that. Uh, uh, Brother Ben, did you want to comment on that? Uh, did you say that you wanted to use... Uh the uh, other translation. Are you there? Yes. Yes. Sorry. Um, All right. 
Go ahead. Yeah, bro. I like to do King James. I like to do King James because of two reasons. One is um, it's it's it doesn't have some of the uh, obscure arcade uh, words like betwixt and redound like the uh, King James does, and I just think it's easier to read. But it's uh, it has the same precision uh, that the King James has, which I like, and also it calls out when there's a, uh, a manuscript a, a textual variant where there's other manuscripts might say something differently. So I, I like it for that reason. Um, and for this verse that Renee said it well, um, and it, I think it's important to back up a little bit where like Renee said that um, they, Paul here is when it says for he himself is our peace who has made both one. Well, the both there, I believe again is referring to the, uh, circumcised and the uncircumcised, those with the law uh, of Moses and those that did not have the law of Moses. So those who under who were under covenant of God um, and those who didn't have a covenant of God, were not under the covenant of God. Um, there was, uh, be between those two people groups, the Gentiles and the Jews, there was always a wall of separation because uh, Gentiles were not welcome because of their, essentially, they were no, they were unholy because they were lacked they did not have a covenant with God uh, in that sense. They were not holy. Um, and so I think that's all I'll say for that uh, for now. And until we move further down. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see the, uh, the changes between the KJV and the new uh, KJV. Uh, it, obviously there shouldn't be a lot of difference, but I, I no. think that, um, there are people who I've heard complain that there are some important differences, and that's why they object yeah. to the, the uh, new King James, but I, we'll learn more about that as we go. Uh, all right, I'm going to read that verse in the Amplified before I comment. Uh, it says, uh, verse 14, For he himself is our peace and our bond of unity. He who made both groups that is Jews and Gentiles into one body and broke down the barrier, the dividing wall of spiritual antagonism between us. Yeah, I think that they uh, expounded on that really, really quite well. Uh, yeah, this is an important thing to understand that uh, um, uh, the world as a whole was in trouble, but God got a chosen people, um, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who became Israel, and the 12 tribes, and the nation of Israel, these people were chosen by God to bring in the Messiah, the, the Savior for the world. So they were really very special uh, in, in that respect and important to the whole world. However, there was this uh, barrier, it says here, between the two groups, uh, so much that the, the Jewish people were, would not even associate with non-Jews. Uh, I don't know if they went so far as to consider them subhuman, but they really were, it was quite a, a, a um, I don't call it racial, but um, at least an ethnic, um, uh, uh, what would you call it, prejudice against them. And it, the society was very segregated. Uh, Jews were segregated from the rest of the world. And now this wall that separated is gone. And so now not only can Jews uh, and Gentiles mix together, whether it's marriage or faith or in, in every way, but they, uh, uh, there's no distinction. Uh, Paul says there is no Jew or Gentile anymore. There is no male and female. So uh, let me see if there's a footnote that needs to, that will be helpful here. It says uh, for verses 14 through 16, uh, the footnote in the uh, NSBRE says, uh, the elaborate imagery here combines pictures of Christ as our peace, his crucifixion, that is the ending of the Mosaic law, a reconciliation, and the destruction of the dividing wall such as kept people from God in the temple or a barrier in the heavens. Yeah, I think that's another thing that's uh, very important. Uh, it's, 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 it's actually a literal physical barrier that was set up. Uh, in the temple in Jerusalem, there was a curtain that hung that separated the outer area where the, the public had access 
And then uh, between the, the back area, it was called the Holy of Holies, where they kept the tabernacle, the, the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, only the high priest was allowed to go back there. Uh, but uh, when Jesus died on the cross, there's a record in the Bible, and I believe history uh, records it also. There was an earthquake. The city was shaken. The temple was shaken so bad that the curtain that separated the, uh, the holy of holies from the, the public, that curtain was torn from top to bottom, split in half, opened, and it represented this barrier, uh, a separation between man and God. Or this, this is another way of looking at it, the separation between Israel, which represented God, uh, God's means of delivering salvation to the world. Um, so that curtain being torn open uh, is a picture of we're no longer separated from God. We have access to God because of what Jesus did for us. So, Lord, I want to mention, uh, if you listen to a lot of Orthodox Jews, they still use very ugly derogatory terms about Gentiles. Um, it's very prideful. It's very racist. Or uh, And uh, they literally considered us ritually unclean. Now, in Scripture, it's true. A Gentile was unclean uh, under that covenant. Um, but you'll hear them now. They've taken it to a new level to where, you know, uh, they even say in their Talmud that we're not even human, that uh, we're actually like apes and pigs, and, and Islam says something similar. But they really believe that they are the only ones made in the image of God and the only ones that have the ability to create. Uh, and somehow, I forgot how they explain it, that we're like some kind of lesser animal. And so... Uh, this this partition is still in place for those who have put themselves under a fake old covenant because the covenant that the Jews have today um, are not is not the same as the Old Testament because there was a temple system and animal sacrifice. You can't even keep the biblical Old Testament covenant. You can't. It's, it's just not possible. Not today, but whatever pieces of it they think they're still maintaining, uh, you should hear some of the things that they say. Mm -hmm. It's still considered, they still, that's why Peter didn't want to go into Cornelius's house. You know, I'm just like, I know you know this, but, uh, you know, had the vision of the unclean foods. It was representing the Gentiles being clean. If God makes them clean, don't call them unclean. But they still call us unclean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, uh, let me uh, go to the next verse. It's uh, verse 15 in the KJV. Uh, it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Wow. Brother Ben, will you comment on that first? Sure. Um, well, uh, when, when, when you guys are talking, I thought of the uh, verse in, I think it's Romans 11, it talks about uh, Israel being the, the, the cultivated olive tree and then we being grafted in as the wild olive tree. And in some sense, I kind of see uh, Israel as... Um, uh, as legalism, essentially, uh, in its purest form, and the Gentiles as being licensed in its purest form. So you have lawfulness and lawlessness, but really it's all lawlessness because no one keeps the law perfectly. But you get the idea that you have, you have holy and unholy uh, being reconciled together. But again, neither of them were perfectly righteous. And so that's why they both, uh, they both uh, are brought together in Christ. Um, who was both a, a Jew and a, he had some uh, Gentile blood in him. Um, and, uh, and plus also to the fact that he was truly righteous because of he was, uh, he was uh, born of God. And so uh, again, from him, we, we were, we, our flesh, 
you know, just as Adam knew his wife and they became one flesh, well, Christ be, knew our flesh essentially. Uh, they be, our flesh and his flesh became one as his sins as he wore our sins, and then we we could uh, be joined again with him in spirit, and that one spirit uh, is that new man um, through which the new man, new, the new man came forth. Um, and so we're at fifteen. Uh, yes, so the the flesh. Uh, uh, I think uh, a couple of verses early he said that we were circumcised with. Uh, of the flesh, the circumcision made without hands. So the Holy Spirit, in God's eyes, uh, circumcised our sinful flesh, our whole identity we had in Adam, circumcised it so that any history uh, that we had in Adam, the sinfulness that we uh, still have uh, and did have, uh, that God has no record of anymore because it's been done away with. It's it's dead. Uh, and so we could be alive to God. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, Renee, verse 15. Yeah, um, I wanted to mention Hendricks asked us to mention Romans 5, 1 in reference to verse 14, but we can apply it here, you know, that Jesus is our peace. And it says, uh, Romans 5, 1 says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he's absolutely right. He is our peace. Now, uh, this verse, it's clear. Now, it's clear what the context is. But also, it, it's clear that the law has been abolished. So we know the context of it being abolished here is about the enmity that it brought between Jews and Gentiles, that there were ordinances under the old covenant that did not allow them fellowship with Gentiles. Well, since the law has been nailed to the cross, those, those uh, Gentile uh, um being forbidden to associate or fellowship with Gentiles because they're ritually unclean has been taken out of the way. And so a lot of people want to take the law and split it up into ritual or ceremonial law versus the moral law. But none of the law saves. I mean, we're not saying break the moral law because you can't be saved by it, but that's what they accuse us of. But the, we're dead to the law. We're, we're dead to sin. We died with Christ. And so uh, it's the love of Christ in us that uh, drives us and helps us, not some dead letter. So when it says having abolished in his flesh the enmity, meaning uh, the Jews and the Gentiles had were kind of uh, you know, we weren't enemies, but there was enmity between us because Gentiles were considered unclean because the law of commandments contained in ordinances. And that was the circumcision. You couldn't marry your daughters to an uncircumcised man. Uh, that's why you see in the old covenant, um, them having, that's how, uh, who was it? Uh, Jacob's son killed the, the, the whole family because they got him while they were recovering from circumcision or something. But having abolished in his flesh, the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So he abolished it. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. But he did fulfill it, and it is abolished. I'm so sick of people using that verse out of context. At the time he came, he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. The, the scriptures pointed to him. But now he did fulfill it. It is abolished. So they need to stop saying that as if we're still under it. Because they love to pull that verse. See, he didn't abolish it. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So he's taking two peoples, making them one in himself. So in Christ... There is no uh, male or female. There is no Jew or Greek. There's neither bond nor free. It tells us that we are one in him. And that's what it's saying here. Making two, one in Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, you know, I, uh, you've heard me say this so many times. And I think now um, we have, everybody's in agreement with this. And not everybody brings it up as often as, as I do, but uh, it is very important to understand that uh, the laws of Moses 
um, the Mosaic laws were given to the nation of Israel. They were not given to the world at large. Um, so it, it's a mistake to apply those laws to in the first century church uh, and uh, even throughout all of history, the way that most people relate to the law today, the, the commandments, at least the Ten Commandments, they still think that somehow that is part of uh, Christianity. But it, it really never was, it never should have been. So why is Paul spend some time um, uh, talking about the role of the law, uh, you know, explaining this uh, in his letters. Um, I think that he was kind of forced to do it, just like we were talking earlier about uh, uh, if the context uh, around you, if the people you're with and the, uh, the conversations and the subject matter uh, is, is something that, and you're in the midst of this discussion, uh, if something is said that's not right, it, it, we're obligated to say, hey, I, that's wrong. You're misunderstanding something. I, I want to make sure you understand. We do not agree with that. And, and uh, we, we have to say, say that. You can't just remain silent as um, something false uh, doctrine is being uh, taught. So I think Paul got, found himself in this vision because he, here he is talking to uh, Ephesus, uh, I would think that in Ephesus, how, what percentage of the congregation in the city of Ephesus are Jewish believers? Uh, I don't know, but I'd be surprised if it was more than maybe five or ten percent at the most. Uh, so uh, I, I, we're at the point where uh, a lot of these uh, churches that Paul established and these letters are written to congregations of almost entirely Gentiles. And, and yet he's talking about the law still. And it's why, why, why if, if the law really is not for the Gentiles, as I claim, I think it's because the um, Judaizers uh, are going to all, all of Paul's churches because they said, Paul's the one that's saying that there is no law anymore and that uh, he's teaching against uh, following the law and they wanted to kill him over that. Uh, so they would go to all of Paul's churches and say he's a false apostle. Uh, you've got to get circumcised, which means that you've got to become a Jew because that's the initiation right into the into Judaism. So, and then you've got to follow the laws of Moses. And even the argument was, and you've got to continue doing animal sacrifices. That's what the book of Hebrews argument is about. Uh, so because these people are saying that uh, you've got to practice Judaism, Paul is in a position where he, he has to speak out against it and say, no, you're wrong. Uh, that doesn't apply anymore. It never did apply to the Gentiles, but even to you Jewish believers, it doesn't apply to you anymore. You're, Paul was accused of saying that the Jewish believers don't have to practice Judaism. Yeah, and he, he is saying that. Uh, so uh, it, it's very, very complicated what's, what's going on. I, I, I didn't read it yet in the Amplified yet, though, so let me look at it there. Uh, verse 15 in the Amplified. Um, By abolishing in his own crucified flesh the hostility caused by the law with its commandments contained in ordinances, which he satisfied so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thereby establishing peace. All right, we don't get any great insights from it, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's clearly uh, that um, people, if we understand uh, the um, historical transitional period that uh, we had in the first century, moving from Judaism with the promised Messiah to come, and then the belief that the Jewish believers now, they still are Jews, they still practice Judaism, but now the only thing is, now we believe Jesus is the one that was promised. So that's the way it was in the beginning. That's all that was needed. They're still Jews, they're still practicing Judaism. And then gradually, it went from saying, uh, well, not only Jews, but Gentiles can be part of it, but they got to convert to Judaism too. To The final position is 
no, you don't have to convert to Judaism. If you're a Gentile, you don't have to practice uh, Judaism. Uh, in fact, uh, even if you're a Jewish believer, you need to reject Judaism because you cannot mix your faith between uh, you know, uh, faith and, and law. All right, you wanna say any more before we, we go to the next verse? All right, let's go to verse uh, uh, 16 in the KJV. Rene, um, it says, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Yep, hold on, I'm pulling. <clears throat> so, you stopped it thereby, and that he might reconcile both. So I want to read it all together again. Having abolished in his, in his flesh the enmity, which was the, the uh, making us enemies or not being able to be together in fellowship, even the law of commandments in, uh, t contained in ordinances, ordinances that were against uh, Gentiles being with them because we were ritually unclean for to make in himself twain one new man. So making peace and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So he put to death the enmity that was keeping Gentiles and Jews apart in fellowship. Uh, it tells us that we were aliens, had no hope. Um, and that now we're one new man, neither Jew nor Greek. Circumcision availeth nothing. Uh, neither is uncircumcision. The flesh has nothing at all to do with the new covenant. And so he's reconciling us both Jew and Gentile, which is one new man, neither Jew nor Gentile, uh, reconciled both of us to God in one body by the cross. Uh, and slain the enmity thereby. So when Jesus was crucified, not only did he die, but the enmity that was between us was also died on the cross. Oops, amen. Um, all right, Brother Ben. Yes, uh, one thing I, I think uh, it's good to... Uh, just, just as a recap from last week, um, a key verse from last week was um, stated in, I, I think it's a major theme in Ephesians, and that is is uh, one of the major themes of Ephesians that we're seeing already, is God reconciling all of uh, the heaven and earth in, in Christ, God reconciling all things in Christ. So just to reiterate a verse in Ephesians 1.10, it said, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one, it together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in, on earth in Him. And uh, again, I think it's a, a major thing that um, that Paul is drawing on here is that again in Christ all things are being reconciled. The 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 Gentile, the Jew, all things under heaven, um, and and it ultimately, it's sin is what separates man from God, and so reconciliation is uh, you know bringing together that that which was previously separated, um, and because again, because Christ died uh, in our place, we died to the law. And because we died to the law, the law is what defines what sin is. It the the, the law defines what's righteous and what's unrighteous, and um, and and the law demands that, but it can't provide that righteousness. But only Christ can pr provide that righteousness. So uh, the, uh, uh, the so the death of Christ, we, we we by dying in Christ with Him. We died to the law. We died to sin. We we died to what we were held by. We died by the to the thing that separated us from God. So now that we can be fully reconciled to God, um, and and actually a parallel passage too that I think is uh, interesting is in Colossians uh, two eleven through fifteen. I'll just read that. It says, "In Him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ." 
buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. Um, so again, I, I, I just see, uh, again, a major theme is that all things that were separated from God and were made enemies uh, of God, uh, you only put, you put someone you don't trust under a law. Uh, you know, someone you don't trust or, or, or a foreigner or an alien, a stranger. Those are the people you put under the law. And yet you may say, well, why, why were the Jews given the law? Well, there's all kinds of flip, flip, flip flops and reversals in scripture. Uh, they were favored by God. Initially, they were God's chosen people. They were given the law. They were the first to receive the oracles of God. But uh, that doesn't mean that, that you could be uh, made righteous by the law. But they were uh, they had a special relationship with God in that in that in that respect they had a, a that God favored them, uh, but now uh, anyone under the law is actually uh, an enemy, and so a son is is not under the law because uh, a son of God is made righteous through Christ and perfectly trustworthy. Uh, no reason to set a law to them because they can't do anything wrong. They can only do what's righteous. Only uh, a uh, a criminal do you essentially put under a law? So um, through the death of, of Christ, uh, again, we are made uh, sons and we're no longer enemies or strangers. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, only a criminal is under the law. I hadn't thought about it that way before. Yeah, if you're not a criminal, the law is irrelevant, isn't it? Uh, good point. I uh, I want to say this earlier, but uh, the, the in the chat room if you're um, if you want to make a comment that is relevant to the uh, the study the point we're on at the moment then uh, and you want us to re reply to your comment if you put it in all caps I'm more likely to notice it and, and we'll be able to respond and that way you're more involved in this conversation I did see some interesting comments though from everybody uh, um, Brother Steve had some good thoughts on the law, and Brother Dave said uh, uh, the law points you to your sin and shouts guilty, but grace points you to the cross of Christ and shouts back louder, forgiven. So the, the law, even though uh, we're all going to tell you that uh, we're, we're not under that law, uh, it, 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 it did have a purpose. Uh, and, and and can still be used for this purpose now, and, and that is just to show our inability to follow it, and therefore our need for a savior. But even if we take the royal law, which uh, Jesus says, I'm going to sum it all up into this: love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so he says, I, all the law. Uh, I'm just going to condense it into this, this principle. And, and uh, even if he simplifies it to that extent, can you follow it? Can I? Uh, sorry, I can't. I've never been able to. I, I, in eternity, we will. But as long as we got this uh, uh, sinful body of flesh here, uh, we're not going to be able to love God with our whole soul, mind, and strength um, that that's perfect love I'm not capable of it and are you I don't I, I hope no one's going to boast that they're capable of this perfect love uh, until your resurrected body uh, so but it does serve that purpose to uh, let us know that we're sinners and we need the Savior it did serve another purpose for the nation of Israel because if they would follow all those laws Many of them were laws that pertain to, you know, health and sanitation and disease and prevention. Uh, uh, it's like right now there's laws about wearing masks to prevent a, a plague from being transmitted. And they had laws about transmitting diseases. Don't touch things that are unclean. That was God. See, 
uh, we needed microscopes to be developed before we could look and see uh, cells and, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Bible says that there are things that uh, are seen. No, I can't remember that verse. There's something about things that are unseen. That, uh, oh, the things are made, that, the things that we see are made of things that are unseen. And that's, that's at the time the Bible was written, long before sci we had the advancements of science today, God's telling us that the things you see, there's much more to it. If you break it down, if you were to look inside deeply, you'd see that it's made up the, of the minutest things uh, that we call molecules and atoms and so on. But uh, so uh, many of the, the laws were for that reason. God is, is uh, saying, you need to do these things for your own good. God didn't say, don't fornicate because it's too much fun and I don't want you to have any fun. He doesn't want people to fornicate because he knows that that outside of uh, in a marriage, this is going to transmit sexual diseases and cause all kinds of uh, re uh, consequences that are, are harmful. So um, those were the purpose of the laws. Uh, God telling us to do things a certain way for our own good. And also, uh, if they would, Israel would follow these laws then God promised that they, they would be blessed because of following the laws. But as Rene said, the law was never given even to Israel to, to uh, earn salvation. But all the religions of the world, that's what they're all based upon. A religion is just a, a, a system of do's and don'ts that you're required to follow in order to earn approval and acceptance from God. But Christianity is not a religion. It's not based upon us doing good to please God. It's based upon what God has done to solve our sin problem. Um, I don't remember if I read that verse in six in the Amplified. I don't think I did. Yeah, let me look at verse 16 in the Amplified before we go on. It says, uh, and that he might reconcile them both, that is the Jew and Gentile united in one body to God through the cross, thereby putting to death the hostility. All right. Want to comment any further, Renee or uh, Ben, before we uh, we go to the next verse? No, it amazes me today how how many people still take a piece of law and think you're either justified to be saved or justified to stay saved or something. They, I mean, even you know, from the Seventh Day Adventist to the Roman Catholics changing the Sabbath to Sunday, which is still a Sabbath that's forced under a law it's like they don't get it they they just don't i i want people to understand something it is an insult like even enforcing food laws on people it is an insult to the sacrifice of jesus because to say we're incomplete in him when it says we are complete in him then what you're saying is we're still lacking Jesus' sacrifice did not fulfill these things, did not satisfy God's justice, wrath, and fulfillment. It's just an insult. People need to understand it, it sounds righteous, but it's not. It, it, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, and the end thereof are the ways of death. To man, it seems right that we have to do something, but you have to see it for what it is. It is an insult. It is blasphemy. It's an insult to the suffering of Jesus. Mm -hmm. People right. need to know that. So they stop trying to hang on to this stuff. Until they get that, they'll never get it. They'll never come to repentance. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, sister, did you see what Brother Hendricks wrote to me? He says, um, it's okay, Brother Luke. Not having perfect love just means you're not. Uh, no, you're no. Just <laughs> I'm sorry, I messed I up. I did see it. I did. It, see it. It's okay, brother Luke. Not having perfect love just means you're unsaved. That's right. <laughs> Thank you for uh, making me aware of that, brother Hendricks. You've certainly That's reinforced right. my faith by doing that. Uh, yeah, uh, as we've been discussing so much lately, that yeah, we don't. 
we use these as tests for someone's salvation. Even if we see that a person, we all, we none of us have perfect love, but certainly some people seem to be more loving than others. But even if someone seems to me to be quite unloving, uh, I'm not going to say, well, you're unsaved because that, that proves it. More typicals will use that though. If you tell them you're saved by grace, it's not what you're doing. And you show them it's not the Ten Commandments don't say they'll go where well, you got to love God with all your heart, soul and mind and love other, which is the fulfillment of the law. And so they'll they'll put they'll put that on you as if they do keep that. perfectly. That, that's what's amazing to me. They will always find something to say. Yeah, but you got to, you know, as if anyone does that perfectly. It's amazing to me. Mm -hmm. Well, but it doesn't mean you're unsaved, Luke. As if you said, as if, yeah, that it, it is amazing to me. It actually blows my mind that people can uh, try to impose this legalism on others, and they're completely blind to the fact that they cannot follow the rules that they're telling us we must follow. It's amazing. All right, Ben, are you outraged? I am outraged. I mean, just like what you guys are saying is that, you know, God doesn't give you the option to pick and choose what laws you want to keep. You either keep the whole law or you keep none of it. And uh, it, the law can only condemn you because it, it just identifies unrighteousness uh, in, in, a, in a fallen man. So you don't get to keep you don't get to pick what laws you get to keep. In fact, uh, Paul asked rhetorically, uh, where's boasting um, for, for those who are saved by grace? By what law? He, he, that's a rhetorical question. There is no law that we keep that uh, th there's no law of grace uh, or there's no law keeping within grace. The only law of grace is the law of faith, which says whoever believes in him uh, receives the promise of eternal life. Um, but yeah, God doesn't give us the option to choose, pick and choose what laws uh, you, 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 as James says, uh, you you offend in one area, you 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 break the whole law because it it just makes you it puts you outside of God. It makes you unrighteous. It identifies you as an unrighteous person. That's all it can do. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, I, I to me that's the most offensive thing that I observe in Christendom is that these uh, religious legalists uh, that are not really Christians because their faith is in their ability to be religious. But there are there are charges against others, and the fact that they're blind to their own inability to do what they're imposing uh, on us. It's it's just amazing to me. Uh, let me read verse seventeen in the KJV. Uh, whose turn is it to comment first? Though I don't remember. All right. I don't remember either. Okay. Well, Renell, have you go first? It, it says and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. Yeah, again, that's just talking uh, to the Jews that were already close to God because they had the covenant, and to the Gentiles, which were afar off, as he explained, uh, and came and preached peace to you. And we know that peace to us is the message of reconciliation uh, to God through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. So it came and preached peace, peace to you, which were afar off, the Gentiles, and to them that were nigh, those that were close, and that was Israel. Mm -hmm. Okay, amen. All right, Brother Ben. Well, I kind of commented on this earlier, but um, this is in keeping with the theme that uh, God reconciled all things to himself, whether they be already close to him, in, in in that respect, you know, the, the relationship the Jews had uh, under the law or those who knew nothing of God, uh, the Gentiles, um, God reconciled everyone uh, to him through Christ. And yeah, that's all I have to say for that for now. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. 17 in the Amplified says, and he came and preached the good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away and peace to those Jews who were near. Um, yeah, this is uh, given, uh, sort of reinforcing this idea that, that, that this separation between Jews and Gentiles is segregated society. So uh, the being uh, 
far away the gentiles uh, in other words the jews they kept the gentiles far away <laughs> they kept their distance they didn't want to get too close to a gentile they were unclean uh and peace to those jews who were near so well, of course you can you could touch and you could talk to and associate with fellow jews uh, but now there is uh he preached the good news of peace to them so peace between these two uh, fa factions. And the interesting thing is that, uh, that I looked up recently what percentage of the world's population are Jewish. And I was surprised. I, I was thinking it was uh, maybe a small percentage of, you know, you know, one, two, three percent. But it's really even a tiny fraction of one percent, much less than one percent of the world's population are Jews. So, um the Jews uh, have a, a great impact on world history, and yet uh, look at the, how tiny, tiny they are in terms of uh, you know the number of them compared to the non-Jews. Um, all right, I'm going to read the uh, next verse in the KJV. Verse 18 says, uh, "For through Him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father." Brother Ben. Yes, uh, so we saw earlier that, uh, you know, the the ethnicity, uh, that the Jews were close to God by it, by their ethnicity, uh, but the Gentiles were not. And but because uh, they were the both men were crucified in Christ for those who believe um, they are given the, the spirit. Uh, and uh, that's that's what, how we that's how God wants to be worshipped by not not by the flesh, but through spirit and truth. And so he gives us all the equipment we need to be born again, which is the agent of the spirit is what regenerates us. Uh, and with that same spirit is what we use to worship God. And our flesh has nothing uh, more to do with it whatsoever. Our, it's, we all have this equal and same relationship to God uh, through the death of Christ because he reconciled everyone together. Okay, thank you. Renee, verse 18. Yeah, uh, Paul in several of his epistles keeps having to remind them there is no benefit of being a Jew. Under this new covenant, none of that Old Testament stuff benefits you at all. Your bloodline, genealogy, none of the old covenant customs, none of it avails anything. That's what, like uh, Ben mentioned, spirit and truth. Uh, Jason Jack wrote a book called In Spirit and Truth about the gospel. Jesus was asked, hey, uh, the Samaritan said, hey, uh, we worship over here on this mountain, but the Jews say we got to worship uh, over in Jerusalem. Uh, apparently, the, Samar the reason the Sam um, Samaritans weren't liked is because they had assimilated with pagan nations back in the day. And some of them could tie their lineage back to Abraham, but uh, half of them were Gentiles. So it was a mixture. Uh, they had mixed their, their blood. And so they were worshiping in, on that mountain. And the Jews were saying, no, you got to go to the temple. And Jesus was saying, a day is going to come where you're not going to worship here or there. It's not going to matter where you worship, but you're going to worship him in spirit and in truth. You're not going to have to take a, a, a pilgrimage to go somewhere. All these like Islam and all these places that tell you to do this pilgrimage and go there. It's all of the flesh, people. It's all of the flesh. At best, it's a shadow, uh, but it's nothing. The the Muslims, it's it's pagan, but um, the moon god. So when it says, "For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father," so again, uh, it doesn't benefit you to be a Jew. He has to keep saying that uh, in many places. And both of us, you're not better either, because we saw Peter trying to separate himself. And he was called out for hypocrisy. Um, and uh, both of us are, are reconciled to God the same exact way. One spirit, there is no separation. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. Uh, let's see. Brother Ben, you commented on that already, didn't you? Uh, verse 18? Or not? Yes, I did. Yes, okay. I did. Okay, so let me look at 18 in the Amplified. It's probably not much to it. It says, for it is through him 
that we both have a direct way of approach in one spirit to the Father. You know, so just uh, uh, the scriptures say that there is no difference. So there's not only a, no difference between Jew and Gentile being equally Christians, uh, but there's there's no difference in the way we go about it. You know, uh, the Jewish believers were trying to continue to do Judaism uh, and uh, and impose that also on the on the Gentile believers. But uh, not only were the Jews not supposed to do it, they were not supposed to, the Gentiles were not supposed to do it. They're supposed to be on the same page and doing the same thing. And that is just that we all have the same spirit. We have the same savior. Uh, and uh, uh, that's what, that, that is what connects us and it defines us. Uh, I don't remember where is Paul said it, but he did say really what a definition of a Christian is is a person who is indwelled with that Holy Spirit. If you have the Spirit, you're a Christian. If you if you don't have the Spirit, you're not. That's the simplest way of defining what a Christian is. We have the Holy Spirit of God living inside us, uh, joined to our spirit. And uh, but how do you get it? How do you get this Spirit? How do you get this new birth? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Only because God is gracious not because we deserve it, and only through our faith, not through our personal merit, our, our, our uh, uh, righteousness, our, our goodness, um, and this faith is entirely in Christ, the person and finished work of Christ. So that's, that's it. This is the common faith, and uh, there should be no difference in the way we practice Christianity and the Jewish believer that practices Christianity. Many years ago, um, I was working for a company, and the owner, Norm Greenbaum, remember that song, um, Spirit in the Sky, by Norman Greenbaum? Yes, I do. I always loved that song. It was, it was, it was that, uh, hippie kind of uh, 60s stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah, you should, uh, I mean, if you listen to every word, you might, you might argue theologically about a little bit of it, but I, I think that's kind of nitpicking. The song is, is great. And uh, I, told, I told my wife, I said, play that one at my funeral along with, I have a list of songs. Uh, so, <laughs> don't worry, I, I, I've got it all spelled out what I, how I want that to be done. <laughs> but uh, this song, Spirit in the Sky by Norman Greenbaum, uh, well, I went to work for a man named Norman Greenbaum, and he liked to joke around like he was that, that. Uh that Norman, but um, it turns out that he became a, a believer, but uh, a, what he called a Messianic Jew. And at that time, I hadn't been saved that long, and I, I didn't know what Messianic Jews were. And uh, I was curious, and I went to with him to a Messianic Jewish congregation uh, to uh, you know to learn about it and uh, participated in. It. And it was a, a really a fun time. It really was a, a really a, a uh, an active church service, uh, uh, and not Pentecostal, but in some ways kind of similar to Pentecostals. And, uh, they'll separate themselves in some way, you know? What's that? It's kind of sad because they still kind of separate themselves and identify with that. Yeah. What they're doing is they're, they're trying to uh, do the same thing that Paul is arguing here, that, hey, let go of Judaism. You don't keep holding right. on to it but they, they continue, they want to practice their Judaism. Now, practicing Judaism uh, as, as a Christian um, does not affect your standing before God. It's not, you're not less of a Christian unless your faith is in your practicing of Judaism. Yeah. If you think that you're, you're practicing it somehow contributes uh, to your salvation, that's where you've gone wrong. It's kind of like a Roman Catholic. Um, if a Roman Catholic ends up believing and uh, realizing the errors of Roman Catholicism uh, doctrines. Uh, but, but they still want to participate because they like the service. They like the, the, uh, the incense and the altars and the smell and the sound and this ceremony and ritual. They like that. Um, it wouldn't be a problem as long as they don't have faith in those things as, as uh, somehow uh, making themselves uh, pleasing to God. Um, 
I don't remember what I was, what led me into that, but, uh, um, okay. Uh, anything more before we go to the next verse? Uh, nope. Okay. Let's go back to KJV verse 19. Um, ben, you get to go first on this one. It says, now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Uh, well, I mentioned before that, um, you know, there's a lot of flip flops and reversals in Scripture. And uh, where the where the uh, Jews had the law, they were uh, had a special relationship with God. Uh, now, now through the, the death of Christ. Uh, and his death for sin and death to the law for on our behalf, uh, we are no longer strangers. Um, and the Jews under the law are in fact strangers and foreigners uh, to God for the time for this. They don't uh, come to faith as as unbelievers they are in that state. Um, and I hear people a lot of times too say, uh, you know, uh, you can't um, you, you can't uh, understand God and you can't come to salvation unless you seek and seek and try to understand his will. Well, I mean, that's a blatant law principle. I mean, uh, that's like saying, oh, well, uh, unless you love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, uh, you cannot be saved. God will not give you his revelation or shine his light on you. Um, and that's, that's got the, that's the exact opposite how, of how it works. That's a blatant law principle. We're in the age of grace. In the Old Testament, yes, uh, God was not sending people out into the world to evangelize to them. They had to go to Israel. Israel was that shining light, that that bright city on a hill that pe that the, the world should have flocked to to learn about God, but they didn't. Sinful man never did that. With a few exceptions, sinful man did not do that at all. Uh, the Queen of Sheba did it, but uh, she she was an exception. Um, Again, the sinful man runs away from the holiness of God. You you tell the average unsaved person, you know, holy, holy, holy. They want to run from you as, as far as they can. Um, and again, the under the Old Testament, all those seeking verses that say seek him, well, that was to people who already had a relationship with God. They were to Jews. And even when Jesus said it in the uh, synoptics, they were, uh, he was saying it to them as uh, essentially their king. Um and, but they didn't realize it. And so they did need to seek him. But they already had a relationship, again, under the covenant of law. But um, uh, uh, but again, under the new covenant, uh, the, under grace, God uh, seeks out man. And um, that's what you're that's what we're kind of uh, going into here. Uh, this this last this next part of this chapter is kind of emphasizing. I, I believe that that, uh, again, God sent out the prophets, the apostles um to to bring the to bring in the strangers and, and foreigners so that they're no longer strangers and foreigners but they could be uh, accepted in the beloved and uh, adopted sons so we would be again uh, saints in the household of God. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. All right, Sister Renee, did you see uh, uh, Hendrick's uh, uh, comment? And not really. Okay, go ahead. Then I want to talk about that comment of Hendrick uh, before. Yeah, I I find it interesting that when Jesus mentions two great people of faith, when he's talking in the synagogue, they're both Gentiles. Did you notice that? One of them was Naaman, the Syrian. The other one was the widow with Elijah. Both of them were non-Jews. And we're told that we're supposed to provoke the Jews to jealousy. You know, and Ben made a point that until they come to Christ, now they are the foreigners. And so, what do you say, sojourners or something? Uh, and that's true. I've had a lot of people ask me, so if uh, a Jew that believes in the Old Testament law and believes in the one true God, but rejects Jesus, they're still lost. They, we're told, think not that you have Abraham as your father. So don't don't rely on your genealogy. You need Christ. That was John the Baptist's entire ministry uh, to preaching repentance, to believe on the one who comes after him. And so I, I find it interesting that uh, and he's right. It, it was rare to see a Gentile convert to Israel's faith. But we do see some stories and the ones that Jesus 
uh, mentions as people of great faith, including Rahab. Remember, she's in the uh, list of uh, uh, Hall of Famers. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think Jesus was trying to use us to promote him jealousy. And the reason I mention that is because um, he's clearly writing this book, this letter geared towards Gentile believers because he keeps talking about Jews as them and they mm -hmm. and you as you were, you know? So here it says, and now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners. So I think this letter in, in, in Ephesus, the majority of them were Gentile believers here, not saying that no Jews were in the congregation, but I think at this time, the Jews still separated themselves and went to their synagogue. We see the Pharisees that were believers would not profess Jesus because they were they were fearful of getting kicked out of the temple. So um, it's interesting to me because it seems like there still is a divide. Even though Paul is trying to say you're one in Christ, this is not right. You should be together as one new man. There's still this issue going on. So you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizen with the saints. I find it interesting. He refers to the old, uh, to the Jews as saints. And that's, uh, that's what they're called in the old Testament. And I think it causes a lot of people confusion when they're reading the Bible. Uh, if you don't know the context of that, because you can think some of the temporal judgments of the saints of the old Testament, are judgments on a sealed, secure believer or have eternal consequences or something. It can be very, you have to always define what it means, I think. Fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Uh, again, uh, one new man in Christ. We do belong to the household of God. It's why you're secure. You can't be unborn out of his family. Even if your faith is shaken, people are saying, well, you can't lose it by sinning. But if you don't keep believing, you'll lose it. No, it, it says the foundation of God stands sure having these promises. <laughs> so we, we can never even say us, we're keeping ourselves saved because we keep believing. It, we can't say that. Uh, even when we believe not, yet he abides faithful, can't deny himself. God knows the end from the beginning. He is not going to save someone. Give them to Jesus that he can't keep. Mm -hmm. Not an Indian giver. Mm -hmm. Eternal security is all over the Bible. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Boy, not only did he do everything that was needed for me to get saved, but I never have to worry that uh, I can lose it because he keeps me. He uh, will never forsake me. So uh, what a comfort that is. Uh, there is a comment by Hendricks. I'm, wow, it's, it's really amazing. It's, it's such a simple comment, but it's quite profound, and I'm surprised I missed it. Or uh, Not that I get everything in, I should out of all the scriptures, but Hendricks says uh, uh, on that verse, a uh, great verse that references the Trinity of God. I, I just didn't even notice that, but when we read it, uh, it's... It says, for through him, that's speaking of Jesus, we both have access by one spirit, the Holy Spirit, unto the Father. So here in just a few words, in one verse, we have the triunity of the Godhead. Uh, let's look at it in the Amplified and see how it's, it phrases it. Uh, uh, for it is through him, that we both have a direct way of approach in one spirit to the Father. Yeah. Did you notice that? Were you guys, or did you catch that, that the, in that one verse we have three in one? Nope. That was awesome, Hendrix. Mm hmm Yeah. Hendrix, Hendrix continues to amaze me all the time. All right. All right, let me... Uh, Go to verse 19 in the KJV. It says, uh, Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, 
but fellow citizens with the saints. I thought we read that. Maybe we, did. We, maybe we did? Yeah, we, we covered 19. What verse? Okay, I'm on 20 now? Yes. Well, I thought we did the last verse we did was 18. That's what I was just commenting on. Huh, okay. Well, I'm confusing myself. <laughs> uh, okay, so verse 19, I guess I didn't comment on it. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. All right, I don't need to say anything about that. Let's go to verse 20. It says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. All right, uh, who, who's going first this time? Forgot. I, I guess can. I can. Okay. Go ahead, Ben. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, Go ahead, Ben. Um, okay, again, um, I see here, uh, you know, again, there's many things that could be seen here, but uh, one thing I'm, I'm kind of focusing in on is uh, this, this, this living uh, temple, it, it, who is uh, – so, well, essentially, Christ is that temple, uh, but we are part of the, His body, and so we are we are living uh, temple. Um, and it was built by well, it was the chief cornerstone. The chief. Uh, I, I'd be interested in knowing what um, anyone who knows about architecture about what the importance of a cornerstone. But obviously, it's it's central. It's funda foundational. Um, the uh, Christ is the chief cornerstone, uh, and he chose his apostles and sent them out and gave them authority to uh, speak his word. Um, and again, he, God God sent them out to draw the world into him. Um, and I also, too, is that, you know, the fact that these uh, apostles and prophets were part of the foundation, um, I, I would uh, argue that uh, that's, that's a a strong argument that there's no longer apostles today. I don't believe there are, but I think this verse uh, could be used to support that because again, this, this was the initial foundation laid by the apostles who wrote the, the scriptures and uh, there's no need for these ap apostles anymore. Um, um, and so we're just covering verse 20 here. Yeah, just, yes, just 20. Okay. Yeah. I guess I'm done then. Uh -huh. All right, Sister Renee. Ben made a good point. Uh, you know, the Jews were all about their temple, their literal temple. That's why Jesus said, tear down this temple in three days. I'll build it up. And they're like, it took 40 years to build this temple. They're so blind. And so uh, this is a picture of the temple of God, formerly a literal building, uh, showing us what his true building is. Uh, and built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now we see that the Jews stumbled at that stumbling stone. We also see uh, Moses striking a rock, which is a shadow of Jesus being struck for our offenses. That's why when he was told to speak to the rock and he hit it twice, it was, he couldn't enter the promised land. It's an insult because uh, Jesus only had to die once to save us. But uh, for the Roman Catholics out there, Jesus is that rock. Okay. Peter is not the rock. He's a chip off the rock. The revelation given to Peter is the rock that Jesus is the son of God. That's the rock. And so it's a really unfortunate thing when an entire church's foundation is built on the wrong thing. Uh, it shows you here Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, as um, uh, Ben was saying, it's uh, st structurally necessary to the foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. Well, we have a lot of good comments in the chat room about this cornerstone. I want to look at that more, but uh, let me read it. Verse 20 in the Amplified first. Uh, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Yeah. Uh, that's why I, I uh, say I am a Christian rather than Christian. 
uh, if you're just out in a public or in a group of people and you happen to say the word Christian and ask, well, what what's Christian mean? What is a Christian? Boy, you just try it sometime and you're going to get so many different definitions. Uh, uh, it's, it, it's become very ambiguous uh, the way people would define it. Um, and I think if, if we everybody was calling this uh, Christianity, it would help quite a bit because uh, by emphasizing it and pronouncing it as Christian, uh, it, it makes Christ the foundation and the cornerstone. It's all about Christ. And but what it's become is his name is not even pronounced. I mean, it's Christ, Christianity. Uh, they, they've even reduced it so that his name is not even being, uh, uh, you know, glorified and elevated as the name above all names. The only whereby, the only name whereby we must be saved. So um, this idea of it being cornerstone and the foundation uh, is really we can't get away from that. That that idea is our foundation, is our cornerstone. Uh, now, what is a cornerstone, though? Um, interesting comments here. I'll look, look at some of these here. Um, let me see. Rich Bob says, a cornerstone is the first stone laid of a building, specifically the foundation. Uh, Hendrick says, if I remember right, a cornerstone is like the very foundational beginning part or vital part of a foundation in architecture. You remove the cornerstone, the whole building collapses. Uh, Sister Heather says, the cornerstone holds all the other stones in place. If it is not there, or if it is removed for any reason, there is no way for the building to stand. Um, yeah, a, a lot of really good uh, insights on uh, cornerstone. And so we need to realize that uh, this cornerstone is um, even more important than the foundation because you can't have a foundation without a cornerstone to get it started. And so it all depends on your cornerstone. And then the, you build the foundation around that. And then uh, everything else is stacked upon that. Paul illustrates it beautifully in other parts of scripture uh, about being lively, uh, the believers being lively stones. Uh, I don't remember if that's, if that's coming up or not. Uh, all right, let's go back to the KJV for the next verse, uh, verse 21. And the KJV says, um, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Sister Renee? Yeah, it, it's just continuing the picture of us, as Ben said, a living building. Uh, so all of us, Jews and Gentiles, one new man, in all the building fitly framed together. So we have to see Jesus as the chief cornerstone. Uh, the foundation is laid with him, the apostles and prophets, prophets meaning all the scriptures, all the prophecies they uh, spoke of him. And then we are on top of that fitly uh, working together to complete the temple. Um, so I think it's important to see that uh, because it, it makes it impossible for one person or one group of people to be more important or lesser or uh, uh, less important than another uh, because we're all one building and we, we cannot, you can't remove a, a piece of the building and have it stand correctly. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, Brother Ben? Well, it was it occurred to me as I was reading this, uh, something interesting, um, that when the, when the children of Israel were, uh, when they were uh, escaped Egypt during the Exodus, and God wanted them to build the tabernacle, God gave different people um, in that camp uh, special abilities to work with fabrics and uh, metals and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see a parallel to that with um, with the spiritual gifts that God gave 
Uh, I, well, I, I recently I looked at spiritual gifts, and what I could determine is that there were ten spiritual gifts that were temporary. I believe in the early church to build it, and then there's ten spiritual gifts that are continue to this day. Uh, either way, whether you agree with that or not, um, I think we all would agree that uh, God gave uh, believers spiritual gifts uh, so that we can uh, to, so we his, we grow His church, and not only does uh, not only are we uh, individually the temple of God, but also uh, as a church, we are the temple of God. And he, again, has equipped every believer, uh, and each believer plays an essential role in the church because um, we, we're not meant to be, uh, we're not meant to do this alone. The Christian life is not meant to be lived alone, um, and we all need each other. And again, give us all sp different spiritual gifts, a diversity of gifts to help grow his uh, church. And, and in the church, not a building, but in the church, the, the body of believers is the habitation of God. Uh, and where the spirit uh, dwells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. Um, looks like uh, we some are saying that there was a little buffering going on, but I don't think it's a big problem. Um, let's look at, uh, okay, uh, verse 20 in the Amplified uh, says, uh, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. There's nothing uh, really more helpful there. Uh, so let's just go back to the final verse here, or verse, uh, verse 21 in the KJV. It says, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Sister Renee? Ben, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, Ben? Oh, I, I kind of already commented. Uh, I kind of went ahead, I think, so I'm sorry. I kind of completed my thoughts for the rest of the chapter. All right. Oh, okay. No problem. Okay. Okay, mm -hmm. well, there is one point here in this last verse. Uh, you know, again, with the living temple, in whom ye also are built together, and this is the important part, for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So each one of us has the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. So we are the temple of the Spirit, a habitation of God. So it's important to say that God literally lives within each believer. Literally. We can never say he's forsaken us. He's in us. Like, you know, we, we feel like God has forsaken us sometimes, but feelings come from our thinking. Remember, he hasn't gone anywhere. He's in you. He is with you at all times. And I mean that literally. So it's important uh, that we know that uh, in scripture. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, the very next verse uh, actually says that. Verse 22 says, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. I mean, just think about that. And it, doesn't that just blow your mind, the idea that the God Almighty, the one that is uh, eternal, only God is eternal. N nobody else, nothing else, not matter or energy or anything living or not is... Uh, is eternal only god is eternal that's one of the tests for being god that's why jesus has to be eternal if jesus is not eternal then he can't be god and if he's not god he can't be savior because the bible says only god is the savior so uh the idea that uh, uh this god almighty that made everything and no matter whether you look at the expanse of creation outwardly or you look at the complication of, of creation inwardly to look into inner space where you look at cells and the, you know, the, it's just, I, I, how many times can you divide something? You cut something in half and then you cut that in half and you cut that in half and you cut that. I mean, you can go smaller and smaller, smaller looking at creation. And you'd think that there'd be nothing there at some point, be, but it, it, there's amazing the content is you go smaller and smaller, the amount of uh, uh, creativity uh, displayed by God. 
And yet this God that is so great wants to live inside me and make me his habitation. I'm his home. That is just mind boggling. And when you realize that, um, I don't want to think of a responsibility, but but um, it, we should all we should consider that Paul does talk about if you lay with a, a harlot, you're 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 making the spirit of God go through this experience with you. So it should make us uh, give us all pause to know that God Almighty lives inside us. <laughs> Let's not drag God through our uh, uh, you know, horrible uh, experiences if we are into sin. Uh, I'm going to read uh, 21. We jumped ahead to 22, but I'm, let me read 21 in the Amplified. Um, in whom the whole structure is joined together, and it continues to increase, growing into a holy temple in the Lord, a sanctuary dedicated, set apart, and sacred to the presence of the Lord. All right. Uh, I'll read the last verse unless you want to say more about 21, anyone? No. So I was thinking is, uh, the other thing I was thinking is, is that uh, this temple uh, that is growing, uh, is, as I was reading the Amplified, it says to increase. Well, uh, not only I think it is not only is it individual growth, our individual growth in Christ, but also increasing in numbers as the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Um, I, you know, I, I see that that, that may be a pair uh, an insight there or a parallel it's growing in number as well it, not only gentiles but jews as well mm -hmm. yes um uh, all right um uh, i'm going to read the last verse in the kjv we've talked about it already but uh it says in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of god through the spirit sister renee i did that yeah I know we were on 21 actually. I well, well jumped ahead. Okay. All right. So we've we've already talked about 22. Uh, um, all right. Well, I guess uh, we we have a, a a few minutes left. So actually, that the timing uh, it was pretty perfect. That uh, how can you say pretty perfect? Perfect is absolute, yeah, isn't it? Yep. There's yep. not degrees of perfect, are there? It's like being kind of pregnant. <laughs> yeah yeah uh, all right uh let's let's discuss this as our with our closing remarks and uh, um let's start with brother ben ben uh how'd the study go i enjoyed it i learned a lot from you guys um took some notes and so i'm building my commentary i, I always uh, appreciate that wow that's an important point that you just made that I, I, I hope everybody has listened and uh, maybe uh, others will decide to take notes. Um, and I'm jealous of Renee and, and all those people who have a Bible full of notes. Uh, we talked about this not too long ago, but the regret I have that 34 years ago, I did not start writing down in my Bible. I didn't want to mess up my Bible. <laughs> you know, I, uh, but um, Bible Jim also has an exhaustive notes in his Bible. And uh, uh, once I asked him if I could take his note Bible and, and transcribe his notes into mine, but it, it would be, a, there's so much to it, it would have taken forever to do it. But uh, it's not too late, especially if you're young. And, and uh, I would encourage you to adopt that as a principle now to start taking notes and, and make the notes in your Bible uh, you could. I own many Bibles, so I should have easily been, but could have been able to take one of them and say, "This is the one I'm going to put my notes in." So that's a regret I have. I hope you don't make the, the same mistake. Um, uh, all right, Sister Renee, let's let's get your uh, summary and, and closing thoughts. Yeah, we see this whole chapter is discussing how there is no more Jew or Gentile. That we're one new man in Christ. And I think Paul has to keep saying that it doesn't avail anything to be a Jew. None of these uh, feasts, the law, ordinances, rituals, none of it's necessary. 
uh, and and you see them trying to separate themselves uh, through food laws or tradition or whatever, instead of coming together in power with their brethren, they're still still thinking in the back of their mind they're ritually unclean. That's probably one reason. Secondly, they're Judaizers and and law pushers coming into the church trying to bring people again into bondage and i think paul wants us to know that we are one in christ i i i have never seen anything like it there's so many denominations uh so many uh what is what do you call it one of y'all called it a law buffet one time where you pick and choose the things that you gotta do um and the bottom line is that we're complete in christ it is actually to me, an insult to what he suffered. To think any of these fleshly ordinances can can do anything for us after he offered his own blood on the mercy seat of heaven. What what can you do to top that or add to it? I mean, to me, it's just it's an insult. And uh, the Hebrew rooters, you know, it's true. Brother Luke said it. It's true. If they want to you know, keep the feast and do all these things. Uh, it's okay. I mean, but all I think all it does is divide people, to be honest. And I think we need to find a way to be one, like God thought. And if we understand we're complete in Christ and got nothing out here to bring to the table, there'd be some real power in the church. But Satan loves division. And he'll put a religious spirit in somebody and there is there's pride to it i'm sorry it does i'm not always saying i'm not saying everybody that's in hebrew roots or whatever is prideful i'm just saying there is some pride to it but he wants to keep everybody divided and it, instead of having the body of christ come together in power of like mind standing on the promises of god in joy in peace knowing what the gospel is having clarity having assurance that's why you have people in here trying to talk you out of your salvation. No, but you didn't repent of this and you didn't do that. They're not coming in here because they want you saved. They want to strip you, boast in what they're doing and strip you of your peace. And it's sad, but that's the truth. Uh, and we can see here that he's constantly saying it doesn't avail anything to be a Jew. It doesn't matter. You need to be one in Christ. You need to find your power together. Even in the book of Hebrews, it says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as some uh, as the manner of some. And I believe that is referring to the Gentiles with the Hebrew people. Not They're forsaking assembling themselves together with the Gentiles. I think that's what that's referencing. So this entire chapter is about that. And, and it's an important issue. And it still is today. You can replace the Jews with whatever denomination, whatever is separating you from another believer that but i really enjoyed uh mm -hmm. that was great too tonight mm, yeah hendrix is just on tonight weren't you hendrix yeah th thank you sister that that's what i want to focus on is this uh chat room uh, uh um, regarding the the context of our study um as usual it, it's always a, a joy to uh, study together and I, I, never without fail, um, I always learn from the others. Um, it, it's so much better to study uh, together. Even when I've done my own commentary videos where I go through scripture by myself one verse at a time and expounding on it, when I look back at those, I see that uh, they don't really compare to the Wednesday night Bible studies when we, we have um, more than one person's thoughts and sometimes we hash it back and forth a little bit. So uh, it's just it's just a wonderful thing, these Wednesday night Bible studies. But what I'm uh, most impressed with tonight, uh, I see in the chat room, which is in the congregation, people I haven't seen for a long time. And uh, it's, it's no secret to everybody who's paying attention. The, the, we know the reason for that. There, some people uh, were estranged. Uh, some of you were estranged because maybe I made a decision to uh, uh, cause it, to, to uh, uh, even block some of you who are here now. 
and I'm, I regret that so much. Uh, some of you are estranged, were estranged because you chose to to leave because you had a lot of issues with uh, some of the things that had been taught. Uh, and, and now we've um, those teachings are have been removed and based on the conclusions of our first board of elders meeting uh we've agreed that we must make sure in the future we we keep those teachings out of this congregation and and i think because of these changes now i'm seeing names of people that uh i've, I've always loved you and uh, and noticed it hasn't gone gone without notice that you were missing and to see you back I don't need to mention everybody's names, but uh, quite a few people I see who are participating who in the past were not participating either because you were excluded or because you chose to, to leave. But seeing people back again is just, oh, I couldn't be any happier about that. Um, but also uh, I, uh, the, um, the video that we posted uh, the other day that was a 15 minute clip from our um, our meeting uh, that video um, kind of summed up everything in, in only 15 minutes i mean some people made videos uh, about the the issues that were four hours long uh, we had uh, quite a few long uh, uh, discussions from some of the members on, on those problems and but uh, if you want to get this the short concise summary of the problems that we were trying to resolve that's in that 15 minute clip and as i read all the comments um, that uh, on that video um it's just such a wonderful thing to see that uh, uh so many people that are really happy that the direction we've we've chosen to go in the future and so many people are coming back and, and happy about this uh, and of course, your insights, uh, we've all noticed that uh, even more so tonight than normal, we're getting some great insights uh, in the chat room as we go through the study, um, so much of what you have to say. That's why I, I'd like to keep encouraging you to put it in caps. It's hard for me to I'll pay attention to the um, uh, Ben and, and Renee's comments and, and at the same time look at the chat room. So uh, if there's something you really want us to notice to because it's, it's relevant and you want us to discuss it further, uh, then just put it in the caps, all caps, and uh, that way we, we can't help but uh, notice it. So that's, that's my uh, summary is that uh, not only is it another great Wednesday night, but it's even greater than usual because so many people are, are here that we've missed. Um, all right, uh, anything else from, uh, from Ben or, or Renee before we're finished? Nope, it was a great study, and I appreciated all the comments in chat. They were very involved tonight. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let me see. Uh, Renee, have you made a decision yet about the uh, Thursday, so wh what you're going to do? No, I'm taking some time off, uh, especially with the weather being cold right now, because already my right sacroiliac joint is acting up. Just as soon as we got a little bit of cold weather, I haven't been sleeping well. I've been sitting down here in a chair trying to sleep. So I, until I get, I know I made it through the hump where, you know, last several years, it, it's been tough. The year before that, I was hospitalized. So I just kind of want to play it by ear and not stress myself out too much. And then I'll decide, you know, when I'm coming back to do live stuff. I may do an occasional live stream with just me interacting with chat. But for right now, I'm I'm not going to have, uh, you know, any guests or anything because I want to have Gary Wayne come back. But I want to be in good health when I have all that started. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I speak temporarily. Mm -hmm. OK, right. and then, well, uh, the, the next thing on our agenda then is the Friday night program uh, fun fellowship Friday. Uh, last Friday, we had to cancel the program, but uh, we will uh, be back in action again this Friday, uh, and uh, we will have even more fun than ever, I think. Uh, uh, and of course, Renee, uh, if you're unless you just need a night off and some rest, of course, you're always uh, welcome. I hope you'll join us on Fridays too. 
but we have a, a great uh, panel on Fridays and, and just so much, so much fun. So uh, we will be back and that's 9.30 Eastern time on this same channel. All right, so th thank you everybody for participating and look forward to being with you next time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.